Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a potted history presented by Wessex Archaeology and Hampshire Cultural Trust. This is an event we're doing for the Council for British Archaeology as part of their Festival of Archaeology Digital Week. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Our session today is focused on you. We are all here to answer your questions about pottery in Britain around the time of the Romans, give or take a bit. Before we go any further, I'm going to pop on a short video to refresh your memory and hopefully inspire some questions. So I'm going to pop the video on and I'll be back with you in a moment. Thanks very much. Here we are, back in our main finds room in Wessex Archaeology Portway House. Okay, so this is um, Romana British Black Burnish Ware Pottery, uh, so called because it is usually sort of a greyish, uh, dark brown or black, and um, often burnished, so it's been very well polished. Um, in this case, on, on the inside, it's a bowl, um, and usually on, on the outside, um, often decorated with um, burnished lines. So here are some of the pots that we've taken out of the boxes we've just collected from the store. The New Forest pottery industry began production around somewhere between AD 250 and 270. We have one of these very interesting situations where the inhabitants of the British Isles didn't suddenly change culture, they didn't suddenly become Roman. Put their toes on and move into a villa. No, sadly not. <laughs> the colour um, is to do with the, the iron in the clay. Um, Pool Harbour has a very, very rich source of um, clays that potters could um, choose from. Some examples of the different types of clays here. This is a white firing clay from Round Island, one of the islands within Pool Harbour. This is a, a type of clay known as ball clay. Ball clay is a very fine um, kainitic sedimentary clays and they occur in very few places in the world. Um, but we also have these more red firing clays, which tend to be quite sandy. Um, and you find these all around the harbour and the Isle of Purbeck as well. It's bright green. I mean, we're used to seeing green pottery in the medieval period, mm. but this is this is the same Roman period. This is considerably earlier. These are first century AD. They are lead glazed. Okay. They come from Saint-Rémy in France and were mostly little cups and flagons, sometimes with moulded decoration, but beautiful colour. Very, very, very fine. fine. Very fine. Very fine. So these are thrown, are they? Yes, are those are wheel thrown. Every thrown pot has to be centred before the clay can actually be thrown. So prepare your clay by kneading and wedging and with the correct size lump of clay got usually by weight for the size of the pot you want to make. Throw the clay down onto the wheel head with the wheel going anti-clockwise and start to centre it by first of all coning the lump of clay. These pots, the body of which is uh, an earthenware clay, not terracotta and it could have been fired to a much higher temperature if they'd had the ability to do that but as they are only fired to about 900 between 900 and 1000 degrees they remain porous they didn't have the ability to make them watertight so any liquid or any food put into these would contain for many many years the elements of that food so it would be possible to tell what these people have been consuming. Do we, can we find out what would be in these jars? We could through chemical analysis of residues that have been absorbed into them. 
We don't generally do that except part of research projects. It's not standard because it is an expensive and destructive technique. Some of the pots also have painted decoration. This one, for example, has what look like wheels, maybe symbols of the god Fortuna and wheels of fortune. Nowadays, we use a wax resist to get a design like that. I don't know what the early potter used, but it's some kind of resistant material so that when the pot was dipped into the glaze, having had the design applied, the glaze or the slip didn't actually adhere to where the wax or whatever the resist material was. Some of the pots from the cemetery are also marked. Their owners have marked the bottoms of the pots. This one with a cross and this one with a T. What I will also do is put my initials on the bottom so that when somebody digs it up in a thousand years time, they will say somebody with the initials MF made this. That's all they will know about me. What do you enjoy about pottery? What, what makes you tick in your work? The best thing for me is sticking the pieces back together. <laughs> I love that. To actually rejoin friends after 1600 years and to see the shapes. Mm. See it all come back together. Yeah, yeah, that's the very definitely the best piece. Mm. Other things are interesting. Uh, I like the way some of the vessels have been repaired, for example. At the time? At the time, yes, in antiquity. And you can see that? Yes. Either by drilling small holes and putting metal rivets, generally lead rivets, through the holes. Or even better, when you have glue repairs. I like that pottery shows us that, that people, people are fundamentally the same. Yeah, very yeah. definitely. That's really nice. So a very warm welcome to all of you listening in and thank you for our panellists for joining us. Panellists, if you can switch on your webcams and microphones, we'll all introduce ourselves properly. Oh, that's right. Can, can we can hear you all, yes? Excellent, good. So what um, I thought we'd do is, first of all, I'll introduce Wessex Archaeology. I'm Sam, I'm Education and Community Manager here at Wessex. Wessex Archaeology is a commercial archaeology company but we operate as an educational charity, meaning that we have no shareholders. All the profits we make from our commercial work are invested in our staff and our charitable aim. And our charitable aim is about using archeology span to teach the public about the heritage, culture, arts, and science. Jana, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Hampton Cultural Trust? Yes, thank you very much, Sam. Hi, I'm Jana. I work for Hampton Cultural Trust, uh, which is uh, a charity in its own right that was founded to take over the museum services and the arts work uh, for Hampshire County Council and Winchester City Council uh, about six years ago nearly now. Um, and one of the key roles we have there is of course to look after the archaeology collection because we are the depository for the archaeology that is excavated in Hampshire and Winchester. We also are responsible for making sure that those people who have research questions uh, have access to our stores and are able to access the collections that we have there. And we're also the home for the Portable Antiquity Scheme Officer um, who looks after the treasure finds that are made in the county. Personally, I, even though I studied archaeology, I'm much more of a generalist now, so I'm merely here to answer any questions you might have about how we look after the objects now, um, how researchers can access them, and obviously the work of the Hampshire Cultural Trust. Thank you, Jana, that's great. And I should say, if everyone, if you see me looking to my right, that's because all your questions are appearing on the screen next to me, and I see a few of you are asking questions already, which is great, thank you. Uh, Patrick, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hi uh, everybody, I'm Patrick Ottaway, and I uh, started my archaeological career um, some number of years ago now uh, in Winchester. I was the assistant city archaeologist at the at Winchester Museums and um, more recently I've been involved with Winchester with the Urban Archaeological Assessment volume uh, which came out a couple of years ago and I manage a series of volumes which are appearing under the 
Hampshire Cultural Trust aegis now on the excavation largely of the 1970s and 1980s when I was, uh, some of which I um, was involved with myself. And as far as pottery is concerned, I dug up an awful lot of it when I was in Winchester. Um, New Forest Ware and Black Burnish Ware and all the other lovely pots that uh, I remember from those days from the Roman cemeteries and, uh, and settlements that we did then. Thank you very much, Patrick. That's great. Grace, do you want to pick up from there? Hi, yeah, I'm Grace Jones. Um, I work for Wessex um, and um, I worked in archaeology since graduating in 1996. Um, I've always had an interest in working with artefacts. Um, so I went on to do um, a master's in ceramic analysis and then on to do a PhD looking at um, Iron Age pottery production around Pool Harbour. Um, but currently working. Um, as a fine specialist for Wessex. Thank you, Grace. Um, Malcolm, do you want to say a little bit about your work? Yes, I started my pottery career at the age of 33 after I'd done my degree course in education, after having spent 15 years in the Air Force, never having touched a pot in my life. And I became so fond of, of making pots that uh, I now feel passionate about them. And since I retired from full time teaching, I now teach adult education classes for Wessex, for sorry, for Aspire, who do adult education in the uh, in the Sussex and Hampshire areas. I, because I'm passionate about pottery myself, I like to make other people interest, give give them an interest in it. Uh, and at the current time, with uh, the lockdown, I, I haven't been able to do any teaching, but. Last term, I had 42 students in four separate classes during the week. And uh, some of them have been students in my evening class since I taught them in secondary school many years ago. So some of them are grandparents now. It's a bit embarrassing when I find myself teaching a grandparent. But, um, I used to do craft fairs and it was most enjoyable throwing pots at a craft fair with everybody standing around not daring to breathe until the spot was completed and then suddenly they'd take a big intake of breath. Uh, I don't know why it seemed to be trying to help me not to make the pot wobble. But uh, it's lovely to be able to teach adults, especially those who didn't have an opportunity when they were at school to make pottery. Thank you very much. And Rachel, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, okay. I'm Rachel Seeger-Smith. Like Grace, I've worked for Wessex Archaeology since I graduated. My first job was actually looking at the sherds and the archive records for a New Forest pottery kiln. I then moved into at least seven years of non-stop black burnished ware from Dorset and since then have moved out into running field projects, other material types of um, artefacts. And um, I also manage all the fines processing activity for our three southern offices. So Salisbury, Maidstone and Bristol. Um, Brilliant. And that's about me. <laughs> and Rachel, ha Rachel, how long have you worked at Wessex? Did you have to ask that one? <laughs> Since I graduated. <laughs> I think uh, Rachel is one of our, our longest serving staff and has um, possibly one of the founder members so it's a really great to have you joining us today. Thank you so much for that. So, not quite, fantastic. but it's a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got loads of questions coming in, um, all sorts of ranges. Now, some of you listening um, obviously have more knowledge and understanding of pottery, some less. That's absolutely fine. So, um, but there is no such thing as a stupid question. So I've certainly asked some, if you've watched the videos, you'll have seen my stupid questions. Um, so we'll answer everything and everything today. So to start with, um, an interesting one, I think about social history from um, Amelie. Amelie's asking, what sort of status did pottery makers have? Was their craft respected as an art? Uh, was it a standard job? Is it something that slaves would have done? Um, Rachel, do you want to start with that one? Yes, OK. Firstly, I think for most of history, pottery has been considered a relatively low status occupation and art. There has been an attitude of, well, it's made from earth. Why do we need to pay for that? 
certainly by the Roman period, other materials were considered of much greater value than pottery. For example, the metal vessels, gold, silver vessels, like you have in things like the Mildenhall treasure, for example, um, those would be high status, very, very exclusive tablewares of the immensely wealthy. Glass would also top pottery. Just the sheer technical difficulty of manufacturing glass and the fact, the curiosity value of it, uh, new to in the Roman period, so not, not seen before the first century in Britain, first century AD in Britain, um, suddenly you'd be able to see the contents of your container. You'd be able to see light through it. It would shine in the firelight as the flames flickered upwards. Those things must have been really exciting. And although pottery, from certainly my perspective, I love the stuff, but that really would have been rather dull and everyday and mundane. It would, even the, the classic Samian tablewares are not high status vessels. They're mediocre vessels simply because they're pottery. And Patrick, <laughs> would you feed into that at all? Any thoughts from you? Well, I was going to observe that, of course, they, um, the army made pottery um, and um, it, every army unit, um, well, the principal army units serving in Britain would have potters attached to them. And uh, these were men on the, uh, you know, along with other craftsmen who were brought to Britain by the uh, by the Roman army. And um, in places like York and Chester, uh, they made pottery vessels of a very particular type suitable for the uh, dining customs of the uh, of the Romans, and um, I imagine they had a fairly uh, low status. And they may well a lot of the labour may have been done by slaves, I suppose. Um, but uh, it's rather difficult, I think, for us to tell exactly what status people had. I imagine people who made good quality pots, the sort of fine wares, um, were perhaps treated with rather more respect than those who turned out the ordinary, uh, the more mundane earthenware, which used which used day to day. Thank you for that. Does anyone else want to contribute on that one? No, that's fine. Um, so good job at your teaching pottery nowadays, Malcolm, rather than 1600 years ago. The future. <laughs> right. Um, Grace, definitely a question for you here. Um, so this is about whiteware and particularly um, sort of Pool Harbour um, based clays. So uh, one of our videos that was on the HCT website referred to whiteware, very limited amounts produced in Britain, some of it imported from France. Was that to do with the quantity of the clay available, the quality of the clay? Is it a fashion thing? Um, what, what was special about that French white pottery? Um, well, I think, uh, yeah, within Britain, availability of clay um, and also uh, technical expertise to fire some of our clays. Um, so we were making some white ware potteries. Uh, so for example, in Dorset around um, Corfe Mullen, but um, yes, certainly in the earlier period, um, material coming in from, from France, as Rachel was discussing in, in, her, in her video. And um, this might be a good time to think a little bit about the, the technicalities of firing clays. Uh, Malcolm, do different clays fire at different temperatures? And how, how does the firing process, how is the firing process affected by different clays? Well, different temperatures, yes. Uh, for example, terracotta clay, which has got a lot of iron in it, if it's fired to above earthenware, it becomes very brittle. So you would usually find that even modern terracotta pottery is fairly porous. Even with a glaze, there is still a, a certain amount of porosity. So if you were to put milk in a terracotta milk jug and do this quite regularly, you'd suddenly find that the inside of the, the jug would smell quite rancid. The, the the best place for firing to high temperature are the the ones that we call stoneware clays, which are exactly the same clays that some pottery is fired to the stoneware temperature, if it isn't required to to be uh, totally non-porous. When you fire clay to about 1,250 degrees, it becomes non-porous. We call that stoneware. So clay fired to below a thousand degrees is known as earthenware. And what was the rest of the question? No, no, that, that's fine. I think we're, um, 
that's okay. What I was going to do is bring up um, a 3D model to show people. Um, so we have here, I've borrowed this from the New Forest National Park. So this is a 3D model of a New Forest style kiln that would have been in use. Um, Malcolm, obviously very different to the type of kiln you're using today. Rachel, did you want to comment on um, sort of the, the New Forest construction of pottery, the New Forest industry? I'm sorry, I don't quite get the gist. Sorry. The one thing that this kiln is missing very obviously is a dome of some sort over the top. You wouldn't just have the pottery on the surface. Um, uh, you would have yeah. a, um, a big rounded mm -hmm oven top above it um, made out of turf, um, earth, possibly fired clay plates, although they are not terribly common within the New Forest kiln sites. Uh, but it would be a big thick structure over the top to keep in the heat, to keep in the, the gases um, so that you could keep the the heating it's not just a bonfire firing by the time we get to the late roman period in the new forest so we, we um so we can see a development can we in the way that kilns change over time from that kind of bonfire firing to more technologically advanced we can but the new forest industry itself appears kind of fully formed with proper kilns around about 250 270 you don't get the earlier bonfiring setups like you do in the Ware and Pool Harbour district for black burnished ware, for example. Local pottery in Hampshire isn't an industrial or isn't made on an industrial basis until the late Roman period. Earlier than that, it might be one person in their garden. Um, by the time you get over to sort of the other side of Southampton water, um, you do have the odd kiln known at places like Shedfield, Rowlands Castle, which I think is on the Hampshire Sussex borders. There you've got more of an early Roman industry, but not huge. A couple of kilns, maybe, not whole villages worth of them. Thank you for that. Um, so we've got another question, Mike. This is, oh, Patrick, sorry, this is probably one for you. Um, what what are the telltale signs of when when you're digging in a trench? Um, how, how what are you looking for? How can you tell the difference between pottery and bone? How, how what are you looking for? What are the telltale signs of pottery in a trench? Um, yes, okay. Um, well, digging is one of those um, is a it's not as as um, much of a mystery as people think sometimes. Um, in fact, um, most excavations will especially of Roman sites, will produce an awful lot of pottery. And you can't really miss it, actually, um, because it, uh, you know, it's rather like sort of broken pottery that you might be familiar with in, uh, in, your, own, uh, in your own life, really. Um, there are occasions in certain sorts of site where, because of the nature of the ground conditions, the pottery is very poorly preserved. If the ground is very acid, for example, pottery can be quite difficult to, to find and to recognise because of the nature of the ground. But otherwise, it is quite obvious, really, when you come across a pottery shirt, um, and uh, it's quite uh, solid, quite um, well, usually quite well preserved. The great thing about pottery is that um, it's almost indestructible, really, except in uh, certain circumstances, and that's why it's so exciting and interesting for archaeologists because there's so much of it, and it's uh, it's so well preserved, and it's so varied and diverse in uh, in its uh, in its character, and um, so. Uh, it's quite easy to tell apart from other other materials by and large and um, there are other things made in ceramic of course as tiles and and, uh, and other things which are you know which are sort of similar to pottery in character but um really i would say um you know uh, really only a few minutes of experience in the ground would tell you pretty pretty much about what, what a pottery shirt looks like thank you patrick um and some a question now from prue um another grace um this will be one for you so black burnished ware how was the burnishing achieved is Prue's question and Prue has been experimenting with clay um, she's dried it to the leather stage and she's rubbed it with a flattish pebble um, but she hasn't been able to get that burnishing look and the other question is was the burnishing um, a result of the way it's made or was burnishing done deliberately to um, make it more waterproof? 
Yeah, the burnishing would have been um, done deliberately, and we often find things that would have been used for, for burnishing. But pe yeah, pebbles, um, probably the most common, would you say, Rachel? Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, but I think it must have been quite a considerable effort to get some of the, the shine sometimes. It must have really spent quite a bit of time on it. Um, uh, possibly could have used bone as well, but, but pebbles probably the most, most common. Um, so either to give that all over, um, all over polish um, or to, to do the, the, the lined decoration, um, perhaps using the, the edge of the edge of the stone. You I might even try. Sorry. sorry. No, you're all right. You're gone. All right. Yeah. You might even try something like um, a piece of wood or a stone wrapped in leather or something mm. like that. But it does take a long, long time. Yeah. I'm sure Malcolm will be able to tell us how long. But I know from one pot I played with on my lap at home one evening, um, I took two hours to get a burnish. Yeah, I think it's quite a bit of effort. On one vessel. And actually, yeah, I, I rubbed straight through the wall. <laughs> a number of our students like to burnish using the back of a dessert size spoon. Uh, it's quite smooth. You need a smooth surface. So a pebble yeah. side a piece of bone could also be ideal if it was mm. polished yeah. first. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it does give quite a, a nice finish and it doesn't require a glaze because it looks mm. quite shiny just with the burnishing. Just by and, using a spoon. Uh, Mm. But building from that, um, there's a, another question about, um, and this is one for you, Malcolm. Do, does the potter's wheel uh, spin anti-clockwise um, because the right hand is the leading hand and the left hand is supporting, so the movement needs to be towards the hand? And kind of to link back to the previous question, could they have burnished on a wheel? So as something went round and round, could they have held a, a stone against it with it on the wheel? Right, so I'll deal with the last question first because it is possible if the pot is leather hard to put it back on the wheel and rotate it and, and do some burnishing, but it wouldn't be quite as effective because you need to put quite a lot of pressure onto the clay, on, onto the, the greenware clay in order to get that burnished effect. So doing it on the wheel isn't really satisfactory. The, um, the first question, the, the wheels that we use in the Western world will always, if they're electric ones, they're designed to rotate anti-clockwise. Some electric wheels have a switch so that they can rotate clockwise simply because if you're uh, in, in Japan, China, that part of the world, they have a different method of throwing, which is with the wheel turning clockwise. It's got nothing to do with anyone with whether someone is right-handed because you use both hands equally when you're throwing. Uh, yes, you do want the clay turning away from your hand. So if the wheel is rotating anti-clockwise, it's your right hand, which is on the outside of the pot. And also the clay is rotating away from your hand. If you try to throw, if you've been taught to throw with an anti-clockwise wheel and you get you start your wheel turning clockwise, if it's a kick wheel, for example, it will turn either way. If you have the pot, the, the wheel turning the wrong way, having been taught the left-handed rotation, anti-clockwise, then you would find it very difficult. You, you have to relearn how to throw, basically. I had a Japanese lady in my class, and she could only throw, she had been taught to throw with a clockwise wheel, and I, I just couldn't, I hadn't realized how difficult it would be for me to teach her using my hands on a lump of clay, because I was doing everything with the wheel going the opposite way. So that was going clockwise for her. There's um, a sort of a social history extension to this about um, so the fingerprints we see uh, that were seen in the videos that um, Malcolm and Rachel were handling. Those fingerprints looked to be right handed and both of you handled that pot as if you were the maker right handed. Um, do we think because of the, um, the sort of the historic sinisterism around left handed people and the devil being on the left, do you think doing anything left handed would have been um unpopular i mean this is possibly massive supposition because i imagine we find do we find evidence for any left-handed fingerprints i don't know it would be very difficult to tell i think um without the aid of a fingerprint expert which again are not terribly readily available to the average archaeologist um there definitely are 
and were left-handed people in the past, it is quite common to pick up some kind of tool or implement of almost any material type. And as you hold it in your hand, you can just tell which hand you need to hold it in. And most often, just now, it's right, it's the right hand, but you do sometimes find one that's being used by a left-handed individual. And you can just tell that by the way it feels, by the wear patterns on these objects. Sometimes even things like, um, for example, spoons. You can see wear on the bowl of a spoon as that's been used. And so they are there. Left-handed people have always been with us, at least since the days of the Neanderthals. Thank you well, for that. I certainly have a number of students who are Sinestra, and they still throw with the wheel turning anti-clockwise. It, it doesn't make any difference whether you're left or right-handed. You still, still throw it equally with a with a uh, anti-clockwise wheel. Um, a question here that I know will be of very specific interest to Grace. Uh, so, Grace, this question is about uh, black burnished ware and salt. Um, uh -huh. So, firstly, has um, has a link been made between black burnished ware and salt? And obviously, when you're making pottery, you've got a lot of heat in your kiln. You're in a salty area. Is there any evidence to suggest that liquamen or salty water was manufactured, or indeed salt was exported? Um, do we have evidence for that? Yeah, we do have evidence for um, for salt being um, produced in the same sort of areas that they were making pottery um, uh, in Pool Harbour, for for example. Um, and so we don't have any direct evidence um, that of the sort of links between the black burnish ware and um, and salt production. Um, but it, it is assumed that those um, that there was a link that perhaps the potters were the salt makers that perhaps those vessels were used to transport um, either salt cakes or salted goods. Um, just the they, these industries were running side by side in Pool Harbour, so it seems very very likely that there was a link between them. But we do have evidence for the extraction of salt around Pool Harbour um, and many many other places around the the coast um, in Britain and inland from inland springs as well from um, Droitwich, for example, in Worcestershire. Um, so we have these um, vessels, uh, ceramic vessels uh, known as bricotage that were used uh, to transport um, salt cakes um, and we find the, the sort of troughs that were used to evaporate um, seawater um, or, or from the inland brine springs as well. We, yeah, we, we do find evidence for it. Thank you. And um, the final part of that question was, um, would they have, if they were producing liquamen, would they have been transporting in amphora? And if so, were amphora made in Britain at the time or were all our amphora imported? Our amphora are Im imported, but there are some large vessels that were being made, storage vessels um, and some sort of, um, yeah, large vessels. But the, the, what we sort of think of our amphora were imported from, um, from Spain, for, um, for example, uh, olive oil coming in, um, for wine from Italy, um, fish sauces coming in. But So these were the containers for, for imported goods rather than for the vessels themselves. Thank you for that. Um, so a question here, which is, this is from Mark. Um, so this is a question of myth busting, really. So Mark says, is this true? Apparently, there's a north-south line about five miles to the west of the A3 where new forest ware is found to the west and Rowland's Castle ware to the east, reflecting the division between the Belgae to the west and the Regni to the east. Is that true? Mm. You know. And Patrick, and do you want to come in on that one? <clears throat> well, I think it's more a question for Rachel, really, is it? It's to uh, tell us about that, uh, that possible division. I mean, I'm not aware of any um, particular cultural divide along a line there which can be easily identified in pottery to be honest or indeed in other material culture but um, perhaps Rachel would like to comment on that as well. Well I think we might have something of a, a difference in chronology explaining the distribution rather than a cultural difference. Um, New Forest pottery in all its guises doesn't start until 250-270. Roland's castle production is most famous in its the first two centuries or so AD. 
undoubtedly pottery was made over a longer period, but um, at the time Roland's Castle ware was most fashionable, New Forest wasn't up and running. So in that sense, no, there is no line. It's a timeline, if anything. Rather than a physical geographic divide? Yes. That's really interesting. Um, Could it be the type of clay that was available? For example, uh, iron clay with iron in it. Uh, I don't know the difference between the two types, but could it, been, could it have been the type of clay? Was it anything to do with the type of clay? You know that, Richard? Mm, um, no, I don't think so. I think they were just both industries were utilising their local resources in mm. terms of clay, but mm. one gets up and running early and the other one doesn't. Mm. Uh, a chronological line. Jana, sorry. Interesting question for me as well, because um, we we try to stay away from the word Belgi, um, because there is the sense that actually Belgi can be an awful lot of, of other um, in, in, the, in the way in which Romans described the local population. So it's interesting kind of, have you heard this? I, I think we only use it in relation to coins now rather than any other material goods. Yeah, it's not uh, something we, we don't use these Celtic tribal names anymore, really. I was going to ask, so um, the, the Belgi, yes. that's, that's a traditional Celtic tribal name, is it, that's been Well, around? you still talk about the Kivitas of the of the Belgi. I mean, Britain was divided up into into these uh, local uh, self-governing regions, these Kivitates, and they have names which we know of from such as Ptolemy's geography and uh, other sources. And um, Winchester was at the centre of the uh, so-called Belgi, or Belgi, how you like to pronounce it. And um, and there were other other neighbouring uh, Kibitatis as well, who, and the names presumably remained uh, current amongst the local inhabitants for political and administrative purposes. Is there a reason that, um, as a, a company, we wouldn't use those kind of terms, Rachel? Is is that do is that to kind of remove it from uh, social stuff, or or is it? What's the reason for that? Um. I'm not really sure. It it just doesn't seem overwhelmingly appropriate because nothing stopped at what we understand as county boundaries. Everything just moved across. Um, we know, for example, that the um, the, the the Dorset tribe, the Eurotriges, their style of burial might have started in the late Iron Age. But it goes on maybe into the early third century AD. So it's a style, not a group of people. It's not a name for a group of people as such. Um, other aspects of the culture in the third century were much more Romanized, but some individuals chose to bury their dead in an earlier style. Um, and trying to put a cultural label on the occupants of a particular area is yes we we have we do have those kivitas capitals and things like that and we kind of know who they belonged to but it's not a, a hard and fast division so it's it, something it, we just tend not to use anymore it's really interesting for me in my role as uh, education community is that when I'm out in school, certain something that is still taught in schools now is this idea of the Celts versus the Romans, and the Celts are still taught as a thing. So there is a, a large swathe of young people growing up, and their impression of early Britain or Britain around the time of the Romans is that there were Celts and there were Romans, and they were constantly at war. And from my personal learning in this process, it's been really interesting to understand that um, the Roman invasion wasn't some kind of cultural assimilation. Uh, it, it's, yeah. And there is a, and personally, when we go out into schools, we do a lot of groundwork with teachers to help them understand that this idea of teaching the Celts versus the Romans, um, it, well, it's far from correct. And I, it's nice to know that that is reflected in the material fabric we find. Mm. It's, um, it's one of like, those never-ending problem it's one of those never-ending problems i think because we still have the idea that um, human beings and dinosaurs were on the planet together running around in our education system yeah. right 
<laughs> and, and we might need to do some further myth busting here. So this is a question from Sarah. Um, so I'll quote this verbatim. So Sarah says, is it possible to determine for how long after the Romans left their pottery and skills remained in Britain before reverting to rougher coil made and thumb pots again? So I suppose the question is, is there evidence to suggest that when the Romans left, which might be a question in itself, but when the Romans left, did their skills evaporate and did we revert to less quality? Did we abandon throwing pottery and was did we just start doing thumb pots and coil pots again? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have a big, big problem archaeologically recognising the early decades of the, well, in fact, pretty much the whole of the fifth century. We know what late Roman looks like and we know what middle later Saxon looks like but early Saxon is very very difficult for us to see archaeologically and in particular we have almost nothing that we can put in those first decades of the fifth century. It is quite likely that there really was something that not only disrupted the political system of Roman Britain. Yes, the we got this sort of message from Rome saying, hey, Britain, you've got to look to your own defences from now on in about 410. But although the people just didn't disappear totally, we don't quite know what happened to them. And I think the majority of people went on using their own stuff as long as they possibly could. They lived in their own sweet way. Yeah, they didn't get Roman coinage much anymore. They Production was already beginning to disintegrate. Grace mentioned problems, I say problems, but changes in the nature of the black burnished ware pottery itself, for example, that highlight changes in the industry at that time. And she also said that um, very occasionally you get a, evidence of a wheel made vessel. Well, having ignored the wheel, Potter's wheel, for 400 years, suddenly in that very late Roman period, some of the black, pot, black burnished ware potters started using it. There were all sorts of industrial changes going on. There were clearly big problems with the economy at the time. And it may be that there was also um, environmental changes or I hesitate to say this, but potentially an infectious disease reducing the population that meant that Britain suffered on all sorts of spheres, which broke the link between the Romanized world and what happened next. So you get this reversion to what are really Iron Age traditions all over again come the sixth, seventh centuries. Mm. when finally we are, we are able to pick up and see Saxon activity more easily. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and now, just to reinforce what I was saying a moment ago, um, Emily has sent a message saying, yes, she was taught at school that it was the Celts versus the Romans, and that's the way it was. So Emily's asking, um, in terms of further reading, can any of you uh, recommend any books about sort of early Britain that help dispel notions about um about uh, yeah the celts versus the romans and i think what we might do emily we'll have a think about that and i'll drop you an email afterwards and we'll think of some um things that we can oh, i can suggest a book straight away which covers that the visit of the celts by john collis who's a professor of archaeology at sheffield university and he has written about the kill a book about the celts um and it's very good it, it uh, examines what is we really mean by the term celt and celtic in a historical sense and is very good for uh, busting myths. And um, I would just add that uh, my own children have recently been uh, through the, uh, you know, the curricul national curriculum and they did indeed learn about the Celts and, uh, and the Romans. And it was taught, I thought it was, uh, I hope uh, government's listening, I thought the, the, um, what they were taught was extremely old fashioned, a sort of mm, thing that yeah. might've been taught back in the 1950s, if not earlier. Yeah. Uh, pa Patrick, can you just repeat the name of that book title for us, please? Um, yes, it's by John Collis, and I think it's just called The Celts. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much. So, uh, there you are, Emily. Um, question here about uh, dating pottery. Um, so by now there is a sufficient corpus of pot that's been found that dating by comparison um, is that the most commonly used method? So uh, Mr. Page is all or it's S Page. Um, S Page is also asking. So do we use most dating by comparison, or do we also use radiocarbon or things like coins that are found in the same stratigraphy? Thoughts on that one? Um, yeah, I'd say we date by comparison uh, is the most common method we use for dating pottery. So um, when we find an assemblage, um, we will use look at other published examples from that area. Um, and often those examples may have also been um, dated by association with um, the coins, for example, um, or or samples that were sent for radiocarbon dating. It's also now possible, um, just very, very recently now, to um, date um, uh, lipids that we find um, within the body of the vessel. That's a very, very new technique, but we can now date those lipids. But these are expensive techniques, um, so they're not widely used. You need quite a high concentration of that lipid in the vessel as well to be able to date it. Um, so, yeah, comparison uh, with, um, with other assemblages, and um, it, it builds, so you might have an assemblage uh, where they have been able to do some radiocarbon dating or had some coins, so then that information is then shared you know, for the next assemblage. So we look at lots and lots of published um, examples and it all builds up a, a picture and the dating gets more and more refined, but for our day-to-day -day work, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's comparative um, uh, material that we would use. Just, it would just be so expensive to do scientific dating um, on a on a on a wide scale, but we certainly do it, you know, where appropriate, where um, uh, we can't get the answers from the pottery. Um, uh, yeah, Thank we also. Oh no, go on, Rachel. Go on. We also have a big problem doing any C fourteen dating during the Roman period. Um, 400 years is actually quite a short period for radiocarbon accuracy. And contrary to popular belief, the radiocarbon curve is actually more so sawtooth than tools. It goes up and down like nobody's business. And we have recently found out that because of these, these sawtooth lines and plateaus, in particular in the late Roman period, um, in this curve, we cannot guarantee dates. So we might get a late Roman radiocarbon date, sorry, let me get that right turn that round. We might be expecting a late Roman radiocarbon date from coins and other artifacts, for example, all found together in the same burial. But if you radiocarbon date the human bone and the artifacts found with them, you can very, very simply, very easily get a date in the late first, early second century. Now, this is a problem with the technique still. Um, we need a recalibration of the radiocarbon curve for the, radi for the Roman period. It will cost millions. One has been done for the Saxon period very, very successfully, and dates are now much more accurate for the Saxon period. That was funded by um, the EEC. Now we are no longer members, there is no more funding from that source. So radiocarbon is something you can't guarantee is right in the Roman period because you don't know, for example, whether your early radiocarbon dates are in fact correct or whether they are a, should be late, but they've come out early, unless you have that supporting material. So that supporting material of, still of coins and, yeah, oh, oh God, yes, we couldn't do without it. We're actually better off using the supporting material than we are radiocarbon because we have this problem. Um, and at the moment, there's nothing anybody can do about it because we just do not change in the future. Uh, you know, as technology changes and technology enhances, um, is that likely to improve? I'm sure it will. 
but it really does need this recalibration funding program, which will cost, well, three, four years ago, it was estimated to be three million pounds. We can probably add a million or two again by now. Um, so it kind of, you, you're onto a loser, unfortunately. We thought for a little while, hey, we've got radio carbon dates, they're working in the radio Roman period. This is wonderful. And then we came up against this brick wall. And at the moment, we just can't get through it. Uh, uh, so it's kind of not worth spending the money. And the same person is saying, um, again, a request for some further reading. Are there any um, articles? And again, we might. what we might do is we'll put together a list and send out afterwards some articles or papers on the subject of issues of C14 dating. Are they around? And then we, after the session, we can put them in a list, I guess. Um, there are a few. There yeah. aren't very many. There will be more in the next couple of years. Um, we're still at the stage where we're publicising this to other archaeologists. Um, okay, no, that's fine. Thank you. Um, a question here. So taking going out of area a bit. So we've thought about the characteristics of black burnished ware and the characteristics of the new forest. Do any um, other do other areas of the country also have characteristic potteries? And this is particularly about East Anglian pottery. So do we ever get any characteristic East Anglian pottery, for example, St. Newitz, Ipswich, Waterbeach, do they turn up in Hampshire in the south of England? Or did these communities rely on their local potteries and imports rather than exchanging around the United Kingdom? Uh, we do it post Roman, aren't they? That's Ipswich Ware it is is post Roman, isn't it? It's um seventh, eighth century, I think I'm right to say. Yes, yes. And it comes to I guess you find Ipswich Ware in Southampton at the uh, at Hamwick, don't you, at the um, Anglo Saxon trading center centre at uh, at Southampton. Mm. Yeah. So that, that internal trade happens later, does it? Well, no, you do get it during the Roman period. Um for example, there was a big pottery industry in the Neen Valley producing a similar range of vessels to the New Forest. Just as now, it's easier to buy locally than it is to have things transported around and delivered. Yeah. Um, so if you wanted a dark colour coated ware beaker, you probably bought a New Forest one if you lived in Hampshire. If, however, you moved yourself, from the Peterborough district to Hampshire for some reason, you may well take your pots with you. So you do get some found. Uh, but it wouldn't be a consistent trade. Um, it, they're um, much fewer I, and further between. I was going to say to everyone listening, um, any other questions um, you want, get them in now, because we're coming to the last few questions now. Um, so one of the final questions is sort of a two-parter. Firstly, uh, well, the question is about what makes pottery survive so well, um, and does it survive better in specific ground environments? So Malcolm, from the perspective of making pottery, once pottery has been made, can it be unmade? Can it revert to clay? Is that possible? No, no. Once pottery has been fired, then it is chemically changed. So if you make a pot and it is in the greenware state, in other words, it hasn't been fired, it can be recycled. Okay, and then you can make that you can make another pot with that same clay. Once it's been fired, the only thing that you can do with it, if um, if you want to recycle it in some way or other, if it has only been fired to earthenware, you can smash it up, grind it till it's smaller than the size of coffee grinds and you can mix it with clay and it's called grog and it makes the clay quite quite a lot stronger. Um, another way of making a pottery stronger is, is if there's a certain amount of sand in it. I, I have in front of me here a pot and it was interesting to hear about pool pottery because this was made with some clay which when many years ago, about 20 years ago, we were anchored off Brown Sea Island and we went ashore, I found a big seam of clay and took a huge bag full at home, home and uh, actually made quite a few pots with it. But because mm -hmm. it had a lot of sand in it, it was quite difficult to throw and it, uh, it skin off your hands. 
Now, if pottery is fired to stoneware, then it is much tougher than if it's fired to earthenware. So if the Romans had been able to fire to stoneware temperatures, I think there would have been a lot more pottery still around. Because if I if I was to drop this pot, which is fired to stoneware, on a on a hard floor, it is more likely to bounce than a cup which has only been fired to earthenware or a vase that's been fired to earthenware. So stoneware firing, as well as making pottery floors, makes it a lot stronger. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. And uh, the kind of the second part of that question is, I guess, about uh, or maybe it negates the second part. So the ground environment, because we know that human bone survives much better in some places than others. Does the ground environment not affect the preservation of pottery? Well, it, it would. Uh, pottery would certainly last longer if it was stoneware fired, which obviously it wasn't in those days. So I think the ground and, and uh, what is what is placed on top of the pottery will affect it. And yes, yeah, so we do. We do find that those softer fired, um, low fired wares uh, don't survive as well as the harder fired wares. But yes, the soil conditions do make a difference as well. So if you've got very acidic soils, um, it can really damage the surface of your um, pottery. Um, and also if you've got, perhaps it's a pot that's had um, shell or calcareous inclusions added to the clay um, when they're making the vessel, the temper. Um, that it can it can get it can become leached out from the sort of acidic soil condition, so it does affect the the soil can affect the condition. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, and uh, the final question, Michaela. Again, this is about further reading. Off the tops of your heads, uh, panelists, um, is there any publications <coughs> listing kiln sites and analysing them? Um, and can, have we done analysing any them? Like, or well, have we done any publications on kiln sites? Are there, people can read or oh, not should we make a list and we can distribute it afterwards yeah, yeah. that will be easier yeah, yeah, Vivian, Vivian, oh. um, Vivian Swan pottery Vivian kills the Rowan yeah. Britain is the one yeah, yeah. It's a really yeah. Good. Well, that yeah. one live as well yeah and can we just repeat the title of that one Patrick that's uh, I think it's called Pottery Kilns of Roman Britain by Vivian Jones published by the Royal Commission of Vivian Swan I'm sorry yes Vivian Swan that's right yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. I hope that's helpful for your research, Michaela. But what we'll do, and that's um, a good question actually, if you're interested in receiving a kind of a, a further reading list or you want to hear from us about future events, can you type a big yes in the questions box um, and then we'll get that list out to you and we'll also let you know about future events from HCT and Wessex. That is uh, about all we have time for on the panel today. Uh, so what I'm going to do is quickly ask you a couple of questions. You'll have a poll appear on your screen. Uh, the first poll, says uh how, how much have you enjoyed this session so if you've really enjoyed it give us a big five uh if you haven't enjoyed it so much give us a one and i'll give you a few moments to get your answers in thank you thank you for that Marvellous, thank you so much. And the other poll I was going to ask you is, do you feel you've discovered something new today? So if you feel like you've discovered something new, click yes. Uh, if you haven't discovered anything new, click no. And it's a really helpful way for us to work out if we're saying the right thing. Fantastic, thank you so much for that. So all that remains to be seen, or to be said, really, is thank you very much to all our panellists for attending today. Panellists, do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share? I'd like I think to the like layout up at uh, Wessex Archaeology and have a look at some of those shirts. Yes. Yeah. And come please as well. And y Jana, is it worth saying, are all your sites open now? Well, it's it's a mixed bag, as you can imagine. We're we're trying our best. Uh, the first sites opened: uh, Winchester City Museum, the Westgate, Milestones, the Red House, and Aldershot Military Museum opened at the start of the the month. Uh, we followed up just this week with uh, museums at the Willis in Basingstoke, Gosport, um, and we're continuing on as quickly as we can, as soon as the venue is ready, um, and we've made all the adjustments um, to keep every visitor safe. Uh, they're opening up. So 
please look out, come and see us. Um, we are, and we are continuing on with some digital content in the same time. If you haven't already, please sign up for the Culture on Call newsletter as well. So let us, we can let you know about more things that are coming out about collections, but also about other art and, and social history aspects that we are working on. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been fantastic. I want to just big, big thank you to everybody for, for joining in. This is the first time we've done something like this together. So uh, it was really great to, to do this project. Thank you very much. And again, thank you everyone for coming. So we'll leave it there for today. Uh, a recording of this will be available. That will be on the HCT um, channels and on the Wessex Archaeology YouTube. Thank you panellists so much for both contributing to the videos and contributing to the Q&A. That's great. So thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Stay well. Bye. 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 B